where two brothers embark on a thrilling journey through the realms of scientific inquiry, the enigmatic mysteries of the past, and the uncharted territories of spirituality. Join us as we explore the wonders of our world and beyond, all while embracing the roles of curious bystanders rather than experts. Together, we'll unravel the intricate tapestry of existence, blending the dichotomies of knowledge and wonder, Get ready to question, ponder, and delve into the dualities that shape our understanding of reality on Duality Check. I'm Drew. And I'm Dean. And today we are going to be talking um, about, uh, well, to build off of last episode, last episode we were talking about science and we were talking about kind of its blind spots, its limitations, so if we don't really buy into like the official scientific narrative of our ancient past, the narrative, yeah. what are the possibilities for what could have been? Yep, exactly. Um, so we're going to go into some of that. <clears throat> yeah. And the important thing you just said there was narrative too. Like we understand that science has a lot to offer when it comes to evidence and when it comes to evidence collection and when it comes to synthesizing all that, but there are still blind spots. What's the narrative that the scientific community is coming up with to, uh, to, to describe right, the to things that they find all the bits of hard evidence, yeah. right? They're not storytellers. <laughs> well, they are. Well, they are exactly, but they're not very good. They mistake the storytelling for objective science. Right. Yeah, they they come up with the whatever. I don't know. They just can't really seem to synthesize the evidence across all of the different disciplines to make. Yeah, it's just like uh, cherry picking which bits of evidence right. they want to account for, which yeah, bits of evidence exactly. they want to ignore. Exactly. Um, so, on that note, what we're gonna do to start out is we're just kind of kind of go over the basic overview of like what prehistory is kind of conventionally taught to us as. Yeah. Um, and then we'll talk about like what is kind of the big alternate theory. Um, the big one. Yeah. So uh, as we all have learned in school or through documentaries on TV, watching the History Channel we, before it became all about uh, – <laughs> <laughs> like Pawn Stars and or whatever the heck is on there now. Oh my god, yeah. Um, I like Pawn Stars every once in a while. Yeah, you find yeah. some cool just, artifacts on there. I mean, I guess there's little historical <laughs> stories attached. No, but to I hear what you're stuff, saying. The History Channel is uh, not exactly only history. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, us humans, Homo humans, sapiens. Where did we come from? Sapiens. Um. We. How did we get here? evolve from apes mm-hmm. right our closest relative um is chimpanzees yep that's the closest living creature to what would have been one of our direct ancestors right um and relative of our direct ancestor though right 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 um, so about seven million years ago is a is when um, the first bipeds break from the chimpanzee common ancestor. Well, basically, it was before just, they're even bipeds, but basically it was just chimps that stood up, and then they went and formed their own society. Yeah, and so like kind of the theory about that, and I don't think a lot of this is even. I don't have a lot of issues with this part of the story necessarily. Yeah. Um. But yeah, the idea is that the land scape in Africa changed so that there was less forests and more like grasslands. Yeah, more savannas, more Mm -hmm. flat plains. And that the idea is that 
by standing up on two legs, you can see over the tall grasses to see predators and food and mm. have a better chance of survival. Um, you see the curvature of the earth. <laughs> you'd have to, I mean, probably better off up in the trees to true. have a hope for that. But, That's true. I bet uh, you we still climb trees at the time, though. Uh, well, yeah, because it would have taken a long time for like yeah. our shoulders to change, yeah. our hip joints to change in such a way that it was like efficient for us to walk. Because like chimpanzees yeah. today can walk on two legs. Sure. Yeah, but, so they don't they don't do it because it's not the way that their physiology is like. Yeah, well, if you watch designed. them walk on two legs, they kind of like waddle. It's like a side to side kind of thing. It's not because their their feet are hands basically too. So right, they have opposable. Like trying to walk on your. We thumbs. have opposable thumbs. Yeah, and so do they. But yeah. they also have opposable thumbs on, on their, their feet. feet. Yeah, which helps them grab trees cool. with any digit that is. Dude, imagine being the one of the first humans that were, or not humans, but bipeds. And you had freaking cool finger hands, and you were still climbing trees, but you're running and you're doing anyway. Yeah, <laughs> it would be fun. I think it'd be cool to have thumbs on my feet. Yeah, they also had like it'd be weird, uh, like long curved fingers, which I guess helps with like hanging and yeah, whatnot. They've got long. Like, I bet you the between their joints of their fingers is just longer in between each. Mm. Anyway, keep going. Um. So then. The Stone Age officially starts around 3.3 million years ago. And this, the Stone Age is what to like so the Stone Age is how long? Oh, so I guess we we got seven million years for the ago for the first bipeds, right? And Stone Age represents what civilization or groups no. of so, what Stone is that? Age represents when our ancestors first started using stone tools, like fashioning stone so that's into all, shapes okay, gotcha, in gotcha. order to use it as so tools. It's, not just picking up a stone and using it. Like you can even see uh, primates today, like. Yeah, they we'll use pick tools. Up a stick. They'll pick up a. They'll. They don't have to like use yeah. a stick as a spear or as a weapon. They yeah. can use rocks. The ones, uh, the orangutans, I think they use the sticks and they put it in the tree holes to get ants out, and then they lick the branch. Like mm -hmm, the, that's mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, I saw. Okay, so, right. On Joe so, Rogan, he was showing one picture of like an orangutan hanging off a tree using like a spear into like the water. a river, yeah. trying to like fish. Yep. I saw that too. Which is crazy. So he, he was saying that some scientists today, I haven't looked into this, but some scientists today are trying to say that uh, that chimpanzees have entered the Stone Age, which is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Only so them, uh, four oh, million, three more million years than us. Oh, and they're they're not technically bipeds either, though, right? Right. Are they characterized? I mean, as, they can walk on two sure. legs, but but their body isn't. I guess that's for a good it. point then to go back to like what is biped? Is it when the majority of your walking, or is it just the capability of it? Um, I don't know, and I'm sure. I, I mean, it's probably I don't know either, but my guess would be somewhere. once your physiology starts to change in such a way that like you're meant to be walking on two legs, mm, okay. like your body is shaped in such yeah, a way that, that, that walking on two legs is the most efficient means of propulsion. Okay. So we've got the first bipeds at 7 million years ago, Stone Age begins 3.3-ish 3. 3 million. Yeah. million years ago. Um, and that lasts to that 2000 lasts BC. To 2000 BC. Come on. When is the, well, to about 3300 BC, 2000 BC, depending on like where in the world. Um, <laughs> because different civilizations are said to have exited the Stone Age and into the Bronze Age at different points in time. Right. Um, so you get the Bronze <laughs> Age. Around 3300 BC, uh, which is about like the rise of like Sumer, the first mm -hmm. acknowledged official civilization. Civilization, yeah. Uh, which is in um, the uh, Indus Valley between the Tigris and the Euphrates, modern day Iraq. Yeah. Um, 
and they call that like the Mesopotamian civilizations because yep. it wasn't just Samaria. The, that comes and goes, and you get Mesopotamia, Babylon. Um, a lot of changes in the area, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and not our holy wars. Pretty close to that is where you also get Nordachico in South America. You get the first Chinese civilizations. You get the first civilization in uh, India. Yeah. And then but we, you also get the Egyptians. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Within that, what's the time? What's the ranges between the beginnings of all these civilizations? Do you know? I don't know the dates on all of them. I, can, I mean, we could look them up. But, sure. Um, I'd say the Sumerians are first and then the Egyptians. I don't know when they are. Egypt, the official Egyptology credits the beginning of the Egyptian civilization because there's like the pre-dynastic, which goes back even before that. But I don't know if they totally count that as part of it. Um says right here on this is on the history cooperative.org. The ancient Egyptian civilization is credited for 3150 BC to 30 BC. Gotcha. So 3150, that's well within that range. Mm -hmm. That date. Yeah, that's 150 yeah. years. So that's yeah. So basically, within a few hundred years, you have all of these different civilizations popping up all across the world, and they're supposedly all kind of figured out, let's stay in one place, let's farm, let's, yeah, let's divide make houses. our labor and specialize, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's all develop the all time. this technology. Um, and they aren't supposed, most of them anyway, aren't supposed to have had any sort of contact with each other. We know there was probably some – there was some contact between um, I think the Mesopotamian cultures and the Egyptians. That makes sense. They're pretty geologically close to each other. Yeah, but I don't think the Egyptians were supposed to – or the have Egyptians wandered. or Mesopotamians were supposed to have been in contact with the Indians or the Chinese or definitely the, mm. the cultures in South America. Just based on distance, I mean, it makes sense, but – um, I mean, yeah. But if they weren't in contact, then you have to kind of – you have to have some way of explaining why within the same few hundred years did all these yeah. – because humans – You would have well, we kind of skipped over, but Homo sapiens uh, come into the picture from yeah. our lineage. Right. We should 300,000 years ago is when uh, the scientists – The latest dates so far. Uh, acknowledge the first uh, yeah. modern Homo sapien with our modern brains, mm -hmm. modern physiology. Right. So humans are around for two hundred and seven, three hundred thousand years, yeah. and then basically three hundred. All of a years. sudden, within the same two hundred year window, five six times across the globe, humans all figure out farming and civilization at the same time. Yeah, even if you even if you give it hundreds hundreds of years between, right? You're still assuming that somebody, whoever, even if you're assuming that they all did it naturally of their own, you know, abilities. It doesn't make sense that they all come up with the same systems in in a sense, right? And that just if it was true that they came up with it, it looks like somebody taught them. Whether it was, you know, we'll get into that theory later, but whether it was somebody from a prehistory that, that gave the knowledge or if in their model it's saying that, I mean, it would only make sense that one person or one society figured it out and then shared it. Yeah. So you, even if they figured that it out and then a hundred years yeah. pay, passed and then they were able to move around and go and tell everybody and then right. everybody else developed it at the same, like within a similar time frame, mm -hmm. given a hundred, you know, give or take a hundred years, that's still a leap. Right. But a hundred years isn't going to get you from Egypt to, to South America. South America. Right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Without accredited ability to sail the oceans. And even if you sail the oceans, 
you got to be able to get there. You got to be able to navigate. Right, right. There's a, so much technology. You can't just you happen upon all like of that. these different places. Right, right. <laughs> like, come on. So, okay, so let's go back a little bit then to yeah, so to our genius, 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 not genius, genius. No, genius is smart. Genius is like right. A, genius is like a family. Of species. Not genius, genius, genius. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, so you get the first. Three million years ago, Stone Age. Two million years ago, you get the first Homo genus, the first Homo erectus, which are not just upright walkers, but are apparently able to use more sophisticated tools. I guess these are higher level Stone Age people than the <laughs> still, first, just, still stone, but and like the ones more, they don't, because like Australopithecus. <laughs> Was one of our ancestors, apparently, right? Uh-huh. And they're earlier Supposedly. than most of the Homo species, but they were able to walk up. They right. didn't give them the title Homo; they gave them a different title. So I'm not sure what is so different about their physiology that they don't get that credit. Maybe mm. it's brain size. I don't know. Or is it just because all of this is based on? I mean, sure, it could be brain size. Well, you know, if they measured it and whatnot, but. You know, there's, there's, uh, I can't remember the name, so I won't talk about it too much, but like there's other, um, genius, genus types of humanoid or hominids that have small brains, but still practice a lot of the same things that early humans did. Uh, like there's like religion mm-hmm. and burial and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, you get the first homos, then you get the first. Homo sapien around 300,000 years. Um, and then you get the the spreading out of Africa all around the across world. the world during the Ice Age when the Bering Land Strait is up and you get the Homo sapiens that cross the Bering Land Strait into mm-hmm. North America. And that's all the conventional story. Right. Um, then you get the Bronze Age 3,000 years ago. Egyptian Bronze Age and, civilizations. Then you get the Iron Age, um, twelve hundred, not three thousand years ago for the Bronze Age, three to three hundred BC. Then you get the Bron or the Iron Age, twelve hundred BC. Three to three hundred BC to twelve hundred BC Bronze Age, twelve hundred to fifty five hundred fifty five five thousand five hundred fifty BC. Yeah, and as Iron I was reading Age. up on some of this stuff, it's interesting because there's actually a lot of debate within scientific circles about using these distinctions stone age bronze age and iron age this like three age system sure. is what they call it because it really tries to classify all of human civilizations into what type of metals they can make right which is a weird way to divide civilization <laughs> yeah yeah you would think it would be based on more of like other attributes of their society <laughs> right like agriculture like Agriculture, division of labor, math, yeah, uh, writing, just whatever religion. complexities come out of societies. Like mm-hmm. we know, they there's, do. There's a lot it's of more than just metallurgy. A society on it's just funny to metallurgy is the one that they start. Yeah, I mean, it probably has something to do with the. I mean, it's the a, rarities it, of metals and like well, and how mining and doing a lot of that stuff was pretty yes, intensive, and it, yeah. and it showed a lot of acumen of the society and what they were capable of doing. The so, more advanced or hard, difficult metals that you yeah, can make, yeah. the more precision you can have, yeah. the more uh, technology that starts to open right. up to you. Yeah, the the harder metals that you're getting to mm-hmm. that you can mine and get to, like shows that you can do a lot. Like, I, they make it makes a decent amount of sense, mm-hmm. but still, I understand that thought of like, because stone's not even a metal. Yeah, <laughs> I guess they just couldn't figure it out. So that's essentially the the basic, and the idea of this story is that it's kind of like a, a line from point A. To point B being where we are now, right? Yeah, just so super linear. It's like a linear progression of us evolving, becoming smarter, us figuring out civilization and farming, and us growing, our societies becoming more advanced, all leading up to today. 
Yeah. And it's this nice, pretty, linear story. Yeah. But there's problems with it, um, which you touched on a little bit on, but that's kind of what this episode is going to be about. Mm-hmm. Um, the problems with this sort of understanding of the origins of human civilization. Linear, and a lot of times, like, in overall, like, the linear path of it all, too, like, I don't know that it was that linear. Right. And that's what we're seeing, what the evidence that people are, that they're pulling up is painting this linear picture. But I also want to draw attention to the fact, before we start this next, next part, is that just so everybody has this fresh in their mind that, 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens are attributed to being on Earth. Mm-hmm. Modern, anatomically modern humans With that look modern like us, brain size. modern brain size, capabilities just like us. Mm-hmm. Yes, they had less information based, you know, at the time. I'll, you know, that's true. But you're talking about 300,000 years ago and only. 3,000 or no, 5,000 years ago, the Bronze Age starts. Yeah. You're talking about 200 or 296,000 years went by of where we humans of humans being wearing butt flaps, being <laughs> hunter gatherers, wearing leather. Yeah. Wearing butt flaps. <laughs> And yeah, being hunter gatherers and not figuring this out. Obviously, they lived in small groups, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so the idea of living together was not foreign to them. Right. And I guarantee they had they had allies and enemies, mm-hmm. like we do now. Sure. Like that all at the time drives the creation of a society. Mm-hmm. So why only th- three thousand? Yeah, because it, it, 3, it makes you, something years ago, or it's, five, it's sorry, five thousand something years ago. Uh-huh. Do humans figure out that they need to organize? Right. So that's just I want that to be fresh in people's minds as we yeah. go forward in this. Because I mean, just hypothetically, if we were to delete all our technology and drop a bunch of humans on the fresh Earth, like. Without even all the fresh. knowledge and everything, like it doesn't even have to be fresh. You just get you, you just, just don't necessarily think that it's going to take us that long, hundreds of thousands of years to figure out how to farm and figure out how to how to no. domesticate animals and figure out how to live together in cities rather than sure. Know, there's going to be strife. And there's going to be wars. Like it's human nature. Yeah, that we've seen. And that happened back then but why too. Why did it take? It happened back in three thousands. You know, it happened when the, at the beginning well, yeah, of civilization too. Goes back so. as far as humans. humans do. Do. Yeah. yeah, I mean, even before that, we're talking about animal, the animal kingdom. Mm-hmm. You're talking about chimpanzees. They go to war. Mm-hmm. They have territory. Yeah, they do. So um, let's keep going. But I just want that to be fresh in people's minds as we move forward because we kind of glazed over it a bit with all the dates and stuff. So yeah, so. The other issue that I want to point out with all with this story is that there are fossils, um, there are like archaeological finds in North and South America that push um, the peopling of the Americas back before the Bering Land Strait was open. So the Bering right. Land Strait is that you know land bridge from the ice Russia land bridge. to Alaska. Yep. That North America and Asia were at one connected. point during the point. Ice Age, the oceans were lower, and that created this land bridge between those two areas. And people could just, people and animals could just walk over it. Right. Um, but, and so for a long time, people thought it, it, the last time that was open was from about like 20,000 to like 10,000 years ago, give or take. Which falls pretty well into. Well, yeah, it's in the last Ice Age. Yeah. Um, but not at all points during the last ice age was, was that it open because right? depends on the sea levels. Yeah, because I mean it was ice and it was it was basically built every time it gets cold enough it freezes over and mm-hmm. every time it gets warm enough it thaws out and goes back into an ocean. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's a problem because that's a problem yeah, for we're my, finding for evidence science. of people being in North and South America before 20,000 years ago. Uh-huh. There was a find in San Diego 
of a kill site and a campfire right um that is dated at 200,000 years ago so now you have to figure humans have been there for so much longer and yeah. now only 100,000 years after humans even existed mm -hmm. So and the evidence they're finding it that challenges it shows. that out of Africa chronology. It challenges the chronology for when people were supposed to have come to the Americas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, you know, at that time, at that time in history, there was no map ma makers. There was, you know, there's old well, yeah. fifteen hundred year old or yeah, fifteen hundred. Year old, not not fifteen hundred. There's You're a about the Perry Reese map. Mm -hmm. I don't. know. It's dated to like fifteen hundreds. It's from that's the what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It's from the fifteen hundreds. But uh, we don't even really know. Really know, like we think we know. What we, like we know what the world looks like now based on like satellite imagery and whatnot. And but like we don't know necessarily that the Earth looked quite the same. Uh, well, it wouldn't have during the last ice age. That's what I mean, yeah. So for a long chunk of human existence, we would have been in the ice age. And in the ice the age, you had two mile high ice sheets on North America. Um, so much ice. That's that just North America. The water too, right? needed to pile that up. Yeah. Caused the ocean levels to be 400 feet lower than the, what they are today. So if you drop the oceans 400 feet, it's going to completely change the coastlines. It's going to completely like where where the like the ocean coastlines are is going to be so much further out in some yeah. areas. Um, well, is there any evidence? And I don't, I know, I, don't, I haven't actually looked this up at all. But is there any evidence of like Antarctica having expanded upward, like northern? What do you mean? Like because the we know the North American ice sheet was a lot further south during mm -hmm. the Ice oh, Age. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do we have any evidence of, like, the South Pole having been f further up as well? The, uh, it, would have, you, it would have had to be yeah. if it was symmetrical. But the problem with that is the, the way that we do the science on the North American ice sheet is you're able to look at the land on which the glaciers sat mm. and determine that they're – were glaciers there. Okay. Um, but already today, the the ice in Antarctica expands out past the land. So okay. the coastline of it, quote unquote coastline of once you, like if you're sailed to Antarctica, you're going to hit ice and then you have to keep going before there's land under that ice. So. I see. You, I, there may, I don't know. I haven't looked into it myself, but. There may be ways that they could tell how far out that sea ice went, but yeah. it would have um, had to have been held up by something, though. Whatever methods they use for telling it in North America, like you're not going to have be able to use those same methods down in Antarctica. Okay. Anyway, but during that time, Antarctica probably would have had a land bridge to South America. That's what as I well. was thinking. Well, the reason I was thinking that's where I was kind of going with that was like, you know, if human history was to have gone um if humans were to have been come out of africa would we have um you know is it possible that the north american land bridge from asia or russia to north america there could have been a similar thing or even maybe if it was a, a boat short boat ride and we had some kind of primitive boat technology that could take us to the land of antarctica from africa yeah maybe and then walked across one day when it was opened hmm. anyway real quick we're gonna have to take a break we got some crying babies here so uh yeah we will Baby be break. back with you guys shortly. Enjoy a little music.
Baby is back asleep. Well, we think. Yeah, he's in a weird position, so it doesn't make me too confident. But he's got his butt sticking straight You can see in the his air. butt cheeks through his pajamas, <laughs> through his blanket. Yeah. Yeah. It took a minute, but we're back. Um, refreshed our beers while we were gone, too. Anybody who cares? Yeah. What are we drinking today? Got that New Belgium Voodoo Ranger Juicy Haze IPA. It's got some cool artwork. Voodoo Ranger style. No description on there. No description. What do we got? I think it on the box it said 7.5%. So, anybody, Dad, that's for you. Oh, yeah, 7.5. I don't know if that reach, reaches dad's alcohol content level of acceptance. It's pretty malty, too. I, I mentioned that earlier. Yeah, yeah. I like more I, like hoppy, piney, <clears throat> yeah, old same. school IPAs. Same. This one's malty. It, immediately when I drank it, it tasted like a Budweiser or like a... I mean, isn't New Belgium owned by Budweiser? You might be Maybe right Coors about Light, that. Maybe Coors Light because it's in... Might be right about that. It says it's in Fort Collins, Colorado. Shit. They're worldwide. Yeah, I think this is one of those breweries that got, by that, <clears throat> got bought out. They just gave them all their extra hops, apparently. Yeah. Not hops, malts. Yeah, so we are back. Baby's asleep. Beers are cold. So we were going over some various problems with the conventional theory. Yeah, of origins of human civilization, like, um, we were talking about um, the Bering Land Bridge, how civilization started popping up all over the world, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all at the same time with generally within. Uh, it says, I, there's so, another interesting bit. This may be actually better for later, but um, yeah. Uh, so let's actually give transition. This is a good time yeah, to, give it to us. switch gears and let's talk about, um, what is, if the conventional theory of human civilization isn't what we think it is, then what is the possibility? Yep. Um, so essentially what we are proposing, and obviously this isn't our idea. No. Um, if you follow people like Graham Hancock, Randall Carlson, and any of the Ben Van Kirkwood, yeah. there's a whole community built up around these topics. Yeah, yeah a lot of these people speak at what's called the um, oh, I just just escaped my brain the um, that Comet conference. Summit or that oh. Comet no what's it called uh, the one that Cosmic just Summit. Cosmic Summit oh my yeah, god yeah, yeah. glad I thought of that <laughs> man so. <laughs> Essentially, this sort of emerging theory, this emerging alternate theory, what it's proposing is that um, humanity and civ- well, civilization didn't just emerge spontaneously with farming and everything, and language all and all this stuff all over the world. What happened is that was essentially a re-emergence of civilization. Yeah. And that the origins of civilization go back way further and no one really knows how far. Well, yeah, once you get past that boundary, I mean, the the possibility is 300,000 years at this point. Yeah, or even further. I mean, it could be that our ancestors. But, I mean, that's just the latest date. Obviously, there are other, (laughs) there are more theories talking about the, you know, origins of humans on this planet. Right. That we can get into in other episodes, which we will get into yeah, in other we're episodes gonna, too. We're going all sorts of stuff. We'll go into more directions, but but today's for this for podcast, like the, the high level overview yeah, and of then, this theory specifically, right? Mostly. So the proposed theory is that civilization emerged a long time ago, like way before into the last ice age. Yeah, the last ice age was. Um, ended 11,600 years ago. When did it start? Just so people have a time frame. Do Ooh, you remember? It started. Long time ago, right? Yeah, it was like tens and tens of thousands of years. It was like 30,000 years ago or something like that. I feel like I feel like that's that number is sitting in my brain. But it's not always reliable. What do we got? When did the last Ice Age start? 
2.5 million years ago. Is that what I'm saying? Quaternary, quaternary glaciation. glaciation. That's the start, though. Yeah, and so we were in some form of a ice age. So two point five eight million years. years ago. Yeah, interesting. So just just think about that. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, humanity There's emerged a, in the ice age within the ice age period. Yeah, right. Um, that's interesting. Two point five eight million years ago. I mean, that's actually coincides with a lot of other dates for a lot of the theories that we've talked about or thought or discussed before. I don't know. I'm not sure which ones you're talking about. It's like Zacharias Hitchin and a lot of like... Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so... um, Yeah, so then the idea is that there was a global civilization that was technologically advanced, uh, not necessarily... as technologically advanced, or if they were, it was in... Maybe a different direction. Yeah. I mean, because you can think of technological advancement like one discovery will then open up doors to new discoveries. Like you play video games, like like an RPG game where you level up. Yep. They'll have like this tech tree. Yep. And you have to like put put your experience points into one tech tree in order to open more on that tech tree. You have to put resources and manpower into a direction in order to flourish it. Right. But if you go in one direction, you're not necessarily going in the other directions. So it's possible you can go different ways. Like we went the way of Of electricity and electricity, fossil fuels, fuels. steam engines. But that's not to say that they didn't. In a sense, right? Sure, Because sure. we still use candles. We still use, you know, things that were done fire. Like, right. You know, like we use it in more of a utility sense. Yeah. But also it was around, right? I mean, it's, so you it's just pr- think of You're like, in pretty heavy speculation territory when you're trying to sure. like guess exactly how advanced they are. But there is some sure. stuff that gives us some indications. Mm-hmm. Um, but the idea is that This advanced civilization was global. They had an understanding of the world, of their place in the universe. The universe, yeah, the solar system. They have depictions on a lot of artwork from the period of at least where we just have discovered. Well, there's myths and stuff handed down of that period. But there's also some like in Gobekli Tepe, there are, well, no, it's actually not in Gobekli Tepe. It's, I feel like it's somewhere else. I'm thinking of the um, where it shows the const like the solar system depicted on cave art, not cave art, but it's uh, like the, you're talking relief about art. In the Sumerian tablets. Is it Sumerian yeah. tablets? Or there's some Egyptian hieroglyphs that have it too. I but think there's, maybe I'm there's thinking some Egyptian Sumerian because I've studied that more show of the planets. Okay, yeah, I think I'm thinking of the Egyptians though because I I've uh, I've looked at a lot more Egyptian stuff than I have Sumerian stuff. So anyway. So then what happens is that the Ice Age comes to an end 12,000 – well, starts at 12,900. So we start coming out of the Ice Age slowly about like 13, 14, 15,000 years ago. The temperature starts slowly rising almost to today's temperatures. And then at about 12,800 years ago, it spikes back down yeah. to super cool. Yeah. And they call it the Younger Dryas cooling event, or right? Um, yeah, it's called the Younger Dryas. This period from twelve thousand eight hundred years ago, when we were almost out of the ice age, then we spike down into it again. Yeah. Then for twelve hundred years, it stays cool. Yeah. And then we spike back up out of it. The warming period. There's a dramatic cooling. Then twelve hundred years later, at eleven thousand six hundred years ago, there's a dramatic warming. Yeah. And then that starts the modern era of climate. Mm-hmm. Um, That's the beginning of it. It's still colder, but yeah. You know. So I'll, I'll leave pictures in the show notes of this yep. photo, um, this graph that's derived from the Greenland ice core samples yep. of the temperature at that relative of time. to the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's pretty crazy. It's super dramatic. And it's very dramatic, yeah. Yeah, when you see the graph, it's it, there's spikes when they say spikes, they mean spikes, right? So, 
what there's a group of scientists called the Comet Research Group mm -hmm. that has come to that is investigating that onset of the Younger Dryas that point 12,800 years ago and they have evidence that there was a impact of a comet or some sort of extraterrestrial body that came into our atmosphere most likely was a mixture of air bursts and impacts to the, the north. northern ice sheet yeah in north america which again two miles thick just for reference right so you're talking an impact on the ice sheet will release enough energy to just instantly melt the layers miles of, yeah. of ice yeah. in a giant area within seconds yeah just instantly yeah which will create ridiculous floods and one uh, that water will pour down over land into the oceans raising sea levels well and, and also before even any of that we're talking about the impact itself and the ejecta right of the impact the ejecta of the impact would go all around the world starting fires especially like if it was so the thing with comets is that they're like sort of icy bodies and you can see this with the one that we observed i think it was in the 90s or the early 2000s the one that hit um jupiter oh yeah i think um, you're talking about the other one in the yeah i think 1900s. it was, was that shoemaker levy um in and you jupiter. see as it approaches jupiter it, it sort of disintegrates into different chunks yeah and that's sort of the idea of what probably happened here is that as it is Into approaching and entering the gravitational influence of Earth, the gravity field and the beginnings of the atmosphere, the magnetic field start to tear the comet apart. Mm -hmm. So, so the smaller pieces. pieces will come in and burst in the air, <clears throat> explode. Yeah. And pieces that were large enough would be able to go all the way down and impact. Well, and those would also have a different trajectory than the, than the comet itself. Because they're being split from the comet body, so they're they're hitting Earth in different places than yeah, the so comet is. It's like is, its tra trajectory. Imagine like North America, Canada area getting hit by like a buckshot from space. Yeah. Yep. And the smaller bits exploding in the air. Each of those explosions being like essentially nuclear blasts. But not all the smaller bits are hit, are exploding in the air. There's some bigger but smaller bits that are still hitting land, probably. Maybe, yeah. Probably. I yeah. mean, that's part of the theory is that right. there's some smaller impacts. So we're actually going to read a paper by the Comet Research Group scientists explaining the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. Um, yeah, we're gonna do, we're gonna do a we're gonna do a show. quick glance over of some of the other evidence and this stuff we're not gonna like spend a lot of time supporting because right. we'll do that in future episodes. Each of these things that we're gonna mention could be a whole episode, right? And a lot of the evidence is pretty heavy science stuff that we aren't like. You Experts should read the yeah, I mean, you should read the publication and watch and see the videos and yeah, you know, look we'll at the always pictures reiterate, and reiterate we are not college graduates. <laughs> we are nah. dumb. We're not scientists. We're doing the best of our ability to absorb this information. Yeah, we, we love learning about it. Yeah, but don't think anything we say is fact. Do your own. Um, Definitely research. do your own research. We uh, we are the common observer of science. You know, we are supporters of it and we are uh, skeptics of it. Right. So some of the other evidence. So, well, back on the impact. So right. you have to imagine that instant melting of the ice sheet, all of that water dumping in the oceans, shutting down whatever ocean current is happening, further affecting climate, yep. the air bursts impacting basically nukes in the air, Lighting forests all over the place on fire. Yeah, I mean, all the pieces raining down. So the ejecta from the impact is going to shoot back up in the atmosphere. There's going to be hellfire raining down right. on Earth and, and whatever then, range it might have. The big obvious question is where's all the evidence of these civilizations? Well, yep. with, a, with a catastrophe like this, 
Um, We're talking about most of the evidence of them existing is going to be gone. Yep. Um, the best evidence or even, would be like finding cities and stuff, but where do humans like to make cities? Humans always the like yeah, oceans on the oceans, on the rivers. And when you all of a sudden have this giant impact and all of this water instantly going into the oceans, raising the ocean levels. Yep. Um, any of those cities are, are most likely underwater. Except yeah, I mean, for maybe a few exceptions. Yeah, look at New York, look at LA, look at San Francisco, look at, you know, right. All any, the- any major city around the world. A lot of them are either on river, major riverways or, or on, the ocean. on the ocean. And where does water like to go? The easiest place it can flow mm-hmm. riverways and oceans. Right. So if you have a 400 foot increase of oceans, any of those cities are going to be. F- long gone underwater if you have a 400 foot tsunami coming off of an ice sheet north of in north america coming over land yeah it's gonna flow right on there's already there's already rivers flowing Mm -hmm. because there's runoff from those glaciers already Mm -hmm. starting from the north coming south yeah so any of those natural already existing rivers are going to be a natural flow pattern. So, and I say that only because of eventually that water has to stop and where a lot of this evidence comes from. And this is, we're not necessarily going to get into it today. And I think we're going to have many episodes on this topic. Um, but that's where you see a lot of evidence is in the northern part of United States and southern Canada. And you see where the riverways are and how, where evidence of when water was turbulent and it was flowing heavy. Yeah. And then when it recedes. You're talking about the stuff that Randall Carlson goes into with all the erosion patterns and like Montana. Yeah. And you see like the evidence of large. So you see like, like think of the Grand Canyon in a sense, where you have a giant ca- cavity in the earth that was carved out of by a river. And the existing river that we see today is like 1%, 0.1% of the flow that created what you're looking at on earth today. Mm-hmm. And that's just, we're going to go into that more in, in detail later. But today, so, yeah. Yeah. So what are the other bits of evidence that there was some sort of advanced civilization previous? Um, one bit of evidence is, well, uh, there's a bunch of evidence in Egypt. Egypt mm-hmm. is one of the oldest civilizations. And according to the Egyptians themselves, they inherited all of their knowledge from a previous civilization that was wiped out by a flood. Which brings us to the worldwide flood myths. Yep. So it's not just the Bible. Biblical. Yeah, they have. And almost. Cultures all around the world. There's literally hundreds of cultures who all have flood myths. Yep. Where the earth was crazy. There was a giant flood and civilization got wiped out. And then. Um, people came either from the skies or from the oceans and Restarted. gave them knowledge yeah. and taught them civilization over again. And also, in a lot of these flood myths, a, a, a good majority of them, there's talk, there's, uh, there's um, evidence, or not evidence, but as I guess as evidence, if you think of mythology as a record of history, but... There's the talks of being warned about this flood. Right, right. Just like in Noah's Ark. Like Noah's Ark. And there's uh, other, and even in Greece, there's evidence of like underground cities that were like meant to. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So, yeah. Other evidence in Egypt is the Sphinx. So, um, the Sphinx itself is not a statue built of quarried stone instead it is a statue carved out of the bedrock stone yeah so it wasn't piled up and turned into a sphinx it was carved down into the sphinx okay right that's important to know know, because there's this enclosure around it where um they leveled some of the rock to make space for like the sides and whatnot 
and that's called the Sphinx Enclosure. Right. And so the Sphinx has been repaired multiple times throughout history. And so there's evidence of there's that still evidence, heavy yeah. weathering on it. But if you look at the enclosure that the Sphinx was carved out of, there's really heavy weathering. Um, which wasn't really, um, which wasn't for the longest time. It wasn't looked at. It was just assumed that it was the same wind erosion that everything else was. Right. But, but because then Robert Shock. Yeah. Takes Robert Shock to came, to, came, came he, along. And he sees but it. He, he came after the work of um, of other people who came and, and were more amateur um, geologists. Right. Right. But Robert Shock was a trained geologist, credentialed, like yep. mainstream academia geologist and he sees it and as a geologist he sees this as water erosion and not just water erosion thousands of years of water erosion and the last of a heavy rainfall water erosion yeah and the last time egypt had heavy rainfall was in the ice age yep when it would have been more uh like the terrain that you see there now which is mostly desert would have been would have been uh, forested and would have been not just forested. It was, it was a rainforest back yeah. then. Yeah, it was. A, it was literally what you would think of as a rainforest. You know, in today's standards, like it had all of the the trimmings of a rainforest. Mm -hmm. So it had a flourished city or flourished rivers that you would assume there would be cities along because civilization is just going to move where the the resources are. And then you have the stone vases in Egypt. Um, yeah. From underneath a lot the of new stuff step pyramid. So there's a pyramid in Egypt called the step pyramid. And it's like, it's weird. Like when you look at it, it's like it tilts up. And then about halfway up, it starts to tilt at a different angle. So it almost looks like it like was a sunk, like the top part yeah. sunk in, but it was actually built that way. Right. Down below there, there's a bunch of these crazy like boxes. Oh, but yeah. The that's where they found tens of thousands of these stone vases, which are different than like clay pottery that the yep. Egyptians also did. Mm -hmm. But these stone vases, um, there's people who've done like structured light scanning, Re 3D scans of them. Recently. Yeah. With recently like, you're doing this. With like state of the right art um, aerospace engineering tools to figure out the precision of them. And they are. Like the vertical and the horizontal are like perfectly pair perpendicular. Yep. The 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 uniformity of like the curves are like within less than like that tens like what is it with like fractions of a thousandth of an inch, which is like less it's than insane. the width of a human hair off. Yep. Um, and precision that we couldn't do with our current technology. When we only well, do, we could, what we, but it would be crazy expensive. Well, what the only place we do do that is aerospace and space right. travel. Right, that's where we use that precision. Right, so, today, and we're talking about vases. Mm -hmm. So, for that, more info on that stuff, check out Uncharted X. Uncharted and, X. And we'll he's do doing a lot of work on that. episodes on it. Yeah, he's kind of the mouthpiece for all of the work being done going on, and he's got a YouTube channel, website. He talks with the Cosmic Summit and does other talks around the world. But and then you have the Great <clears throat> Pyramid itself. Yeah. Which, um, again, we'll we'll go into. But, uh, in short, yeah. the Great Pyramid is within a fraction of a degree of true north not magnetic north that you can tell with a compass right true north um that'll it's take you to the north pole 2.3 million stones that were quarried hundreds of miles away and shipped in um oh that was my screensaver <laughs> <laughs> i thought it was the tv turning off it no. does that okay there we go um it's just an incredible feat. No one knows how it was done. Um, I mean, it's just, and we meant briefly mentioned it as long as, or as well as the stone vases in the last episode, but like the Great Pyramid was very precise and it was covered in smooth limestone casing blocks that were just. Right. And it's supposed to have like a gold 
capstone and yeah. everything. Well, and if you, quite the site. Yeah. And if you look at people's work where they talk about the precision of it, and we're not talking about precision where we're talking about uniform, uniformity, like where every block was perfectly cut exactly as it needed to be. We're talking about like blocks that were cut precisely to show how precisely they could cut. Yeah, well, we're talking about there's, the different, there's different aspects. So, like, the parts that you wouldn't see, there's more roughly hewn, but still incredibly precise because yeah. it has to be. Or it else, has to be. Or else once you build changed. up from the top, it won't be a perfect pyramid It turns shape. into a spiral. It turns into right. a, to a off-kilter, you know, mm-hmm. you know, hill. Which you can see a lot of evidence of that in later pyramids that weren't as impressive. Later, yeah, um, exactly. So then we can shift off of Egypt into the Amazon where LIDAR scans there have shown incredible amounts of civilization all through the Amazon. Um, Undiscovered. A lot of this is just completely undiscovered now. The only reason we know that they're there is because of the LIDAR scanning. The best estimates. People haven't been on the ground Well, rough estimates based just off the LIDAR scans alone is we're talking like a civilization of – hundreds of millions of people to yeah. have created all that. Yeah, with the sophistication of, at minimum, I would say, the Roman Empire. They had aqueducts yeah. and sewer systems. They and, would have been the first civilization that yeah. had roads. Roads, they had sewer systems, they had, like, full-on They had this, uh, they had this incredible soil called Terra Preta, oh, which yeah. is, like, rejuvenates itself yeah. that we still can't mimic today. We still have yep. to use like fertilizers and stuff to rejuvenate our soil, but it, yep. this is soil that you can keep growing in over and over and over without having to leave it fallow, without having to rotate crops. And yeah, and you can and you can put it down over on unfertile ground and mm-hmm. mix it in and and have it start to grow. Like you can create and that's the idea of what the rainforest the um, Amazon jungle was created by like yeah I've heard used... people say like the Amazon was just like just the overgrown remnants farmland. of their farmland yeah. yeah like they probably made it but because of how much terra preta they they mm-hmm. used on everything uh, and then you have uh, Baalbek in Lebanon which has the Roman temple of Jupiter on top of it. Um, but that that Roman temple is sitting on these three massive stones that are each over a thousand tons. <laughs> That's insane. And then there's another one that was found way later. It was only discovered like maybe I forget exactly when, but like recently in the last couple hundred years, maybe um, where uh, is another one of those stones still in the quarry, but it's 1,200 tons. It's even bigger. Yeah. They almost bit off more than they could chew or they just unfinished. Or something happened and then, yeah, yeah, they couldn't finish the project. Um, Then you got Gobekli Tepe and all the Tepes in Turkey. So you may have heard of Gobekli Tepe, but there's actually tons of these Tepes that have been discovered now. And Gobekli Um, Tepe means very few of them have been excavated. There's just Gobekli Tepe, Karahan Tepe, but there's like another two there's dozen like a, of them yeah, discovered. And they're all generally in the same area. Right? Yeah, and Gobekli Tepe is uh, dated to exactly around, right around the end of the Ice Age at yep. 11,600 years. It was deliberately buried. It's incredible um, high relief carving so it's these huge stone pillars t-shaped pillars with like animals and constellations and all this stuff carved in high but it's high relief so yeah normal carving of an animal you just into, carve like, into the stone to right. make the picture like a 2d image on yeah, a so stone yeah. yeah normally you would like i'm gonna draw a cat so you draw the outline and then you chisel out the in between yep and you that's poke, low poke relief, a little poke a little hole for an eye high relief is you take that shape of the cat and you carve out around it. So what you leave is the cat sticking out. That, mean, <coughs> that means the st- <coughs> sorry, which is much harder. That stone was bigger, and they had to remove all the stone around 
what became a 3D image stone statue on a sta- on a megalithic pillar. Mm-hmm. Like that's just, I mean, we don't do that kind of stuff now, and we the amount of leisure time and and <laughs> division labor we have now, you would assume people would be doing that somewhere in some corner of the world. Yeah, but we don't do they even do that now. Um. There's another interesting piece of uh, evidence, which is yeah. that uh, Graham Hancock talks about this in his book America Before, which is the idea of – so if you look at ancient Egyptians' religion surrounding death and the mythology around death, they talk about like when you die, you travel across the Milky Way to this particular constellation um, – and in some of the Native American tribes in America have very similar stories with right. similar deities, similar stops along the way in your afterlife that you travel across the Milky Way and you end up in that same constellation, which is such a weird commonality that doesn't seem like it could just happen. Yeah, um, especially by a, accident. A, across the entire globe. Yeah, well, yeah. Having similar no one, mythologies. No scholars thought that the ancient Egyptians had contact with the Native Americans. Right. But if there was a civilization before that was worldwide and that was part of their religion that survived and morphed into the Egyptian and into the Native Americans once everything got wiped out and that's mm-hmm. like the remnants of their mm-hmm. religion, it would make sense. Sure. Um, I'm just going to breeze over this one because it was uh, from a book I read a long time ago and I don't remember the details, but we'll have to do that as like a book report later. It's from this book called Civilization One and it essentially talks about all the uh, different measurement systems all over the world and how they're all related. And when you do like analysis on them, it basically points to them all coming from a similar source system. right. Which is really interesting. That is fascinating. Yeah. I haven't heard that. Um, Anyway, we're right about time for another break here, so... Yeah, let's do that, and then maybe we'll start with the paper after that. Yeah, we can go over that paper after that. All right. So, have fun, guys. Listen to the music, and we'll be back. So, 
we have pulled up. We're going to go into this paper. Yeah. So Let's tell the you can find this. Yeah. I'll put it in the show notes, but you can find this and more like it at the Comet Research Group. Yeah, in their citations and link section. Yeah, at the top of their page, they have a link for scientific publications, and we're reading from the first article there. And we'll probably go over a number of these um, as long as they just don't feel like we're talking about the same thing over and over and over and over. Well, I did did breeze through a lot of these, and the first one kind of is the overview. Yeah. So if you read the first one, you're going to get a good overview of the majority of what is going to be um, referenced in the further articles. Or like a lot of those further articles are more like specializations of what is overviewed. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. So, this is published at the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, but that's the PNAS journal. Yeah, I wasn't going to get that, so I'm glad you knew. PNAS. PNAS. Which does not at all. Don't say that fast. (laughs) Don't say that slow. Yeah. (laughs) The paper is titled. Uh, the paper is titled Evidence for an Extraterrestrial Impact 12,900 Years Ago That con- contribu- Contributed to the Megafauna <laughs> Extinctions and them. the Younger Dryas Cooling. There we go. Do you want to read the abstract? Or you want me to read the... I'll read the abstract. Okay. This is by R.B. Firestone, Alan West, J.P. Kennett, J.S. Wolbach. And at all. Yeah, so this is the abstract for it. A carbon-rich black layer dating to 12,900 years ago. That's 1,000 years ago. 12,900 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I said. Anyway, has pre- if, if I didn't know well, has been previously identified at 50... Clovis age sites across North America and appears contemporaneous with the abrupt onset of younger dry as cooling. The in situ bones of extinct Pleistocene megafauna, along with Clovis tool, Clovis tool assemblages occur below this black layer, but not within or above it causes for the extinction extinctions Younger Dryas cooling and termination of Clovis cultures have long been controversial. In this paper, we provide evidence for an extraterrestrial ET impact event at 12.9 thousand years ago, which we hypothesize caused abrupt environmental changes that contributed to Younger Dryas cooling, referred to in the article as YD. Major ecological reorganization, broad-scale extinctions, and rapid human behavioral shifts at the end of the Clovis period. Clovis-aged sites in North America are overlain by thin, discrete layer with with varying peak abundances of magnetic grains or iridium magnetic microspherules. Oh, hang on. So... Let's review that real quick. So, yeah. 12.9 thousand years ago, at Clovis, Clovis age sites. So, at 12.9 thousand years ago, there was a culture in North America called the Clovis. The Clovis people, yeah. The Clovis people. And you can still, there's all these like spear or arrowheads artifacts, and spear points yeah. and artifacts. And you can even, some people even find them just out in the wild. Yeah, I mean, so people in like Texas... it's all over North America. Yeah, I mean, there's people all over North America finding Clovis Age spear points and tips, and this predates... But Native there's Americans, certain right? Clovis sites that are, cert- that are like, really well dated at that layer 12.9 mm-hmm. thousand years ago, and that is the abrupt onset of the youngest driest cooling. So there's people living in yeah. North America, the Clovis... 12.9 thousand years ago when this cooling happens. Yeah. And mo- North America, to be clear, is majority of it is ice. 
only the at southern that point, yeah, yeah only the, the southern par- portions of the of the continent are, are at the onset of the YD you had the massive cooling yeah and yeah that's the yeah the cooling which you know evidence for that is um what they go on to talk about it says um the Clovis age sites in North America are overlain by a thin Discre- discrete layer with varying peak abundances of what they go on to talk about as so, proxy evidence. Right. So that's magnetic grains with iridium, mm-hmm. magnetic microspherules, um, charcoal, soot, yeah. carbon spherules, glass like carbon containing nano diamonds. And fullerenes with ET helium, all of which are evidence for an ET impact and associated biomass burning at 12.9 thousand yeah, years ago. Yeah, that's where you ago. get the charcoal, the soot, the carbon spherules, like a lot of these like high temperature uh, proxy evidence that they talk about. Yeah. This layer also extends throughout at least 15 Carolina Bays. So they don't explain mm-hmm. what the Carolina Bays are here, but for no. people who haven't heard of them... All across, they're called the Carolina Bays because they're out there in the Carolinas, but it's that whole, like, eastern seaboard. Yeah. You find it in other states, too. And there's also some in Nebraska. Yeah. Some of the Midwest states. Like, Midwest over there. Yeah. I think that's, it's, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about those, uh, the the Carolina Bays is they're, they're, um, Ellipse shaped depressions yeah, well, in depressions, the earth. Yeah. And some of them are like swampland and stuff now. But they're pretty uniform, the shape. Yeah. Just they're like the a size. really clean, like ellipse. Yeah. And like because it's an ellipse, it, there's like a long direction and a short direction. And you can like draw a line through right. the long direction right. to see where that ellipse points to. Right. And if you do that on a map for each of these ellipses all across the eastern seaboard, they all point in the same direction, which is like the Great Lakes region. Yeah, that's the origin zone, if you will, like where all of the points, you know, coincide. Mm-hmm. So that's what they're talking about here in this paper. So they're talking about all these different sites from Clovis, and they're talking about 15 of these Carolina bays as sites. Where they're showing some of that evidence, right? Right. Yeah. And so they're finding all these proxies, the mi- microspherules, the fullerenes, the carbon, soot, charcoal, all that stuff. Yeah. But they're finding all those in that layer right. at all those sites. And that is important because if you talk about an extraterrestrial impact and only where you see evidence of impact do you see the evidence. Where the originating point right. is, and if the you go to that twelve point nine, plus all the places where all the ejected yeah, kind of lands, right? You go to that twelve point nine layer at any of these sites, you'll find the black mat. The black mat, yeah, exactly. I, I think they'll cover here pretty soon. They go on here in the abstract to they say we propose that one or more large low density ET objects exploded over. Over north, northern North America, partially destabilizing the Laurentide ice sheet and triggering Younger Dry's cooling. The shockwave, thermal pulse, and event-related environmental effects, such as extensive biomass burning and food limitations, contributed to end Pleistocene megafaunal extinctions and adaptive shifts among Paleo-Americans in North America. So, yeah, I mean, that talks about what the impacts of the continent were. Right. So we all have at least heard of these, like, Ice Age mammals that used to live here in North America, the woolly mammoths, the saber-toothed tigers. There's the ground sloths. The ground sloths. The epic. Yeah, there's these giant beavers. Yep. Just massive stuff that you find really only bear. in Asia and 
South America or, or like uh, Africa, Africa, yeah, mostly. Africa still has, has the animals mo- like the, this. Well, they have the biggest, mm-hmm. but the not on them in Asia do right. But North America lost a lot of our large, all of all of you know above a certain weight class, all of them besides right. the oceans, right? But those aren't you know North American specific. I think they get into that here, right? <clears throat> or is that a different um, thing we read? Before? So that's the a- that's the abstract. So then we get into the the article here. If you want to read that first part, a carbon rich black layer dating to twelve point nine thousand years ago. That's twelve thousand nine hundred calendar years before present. It has been identified by C. V. Haynes Jr. at over fifty sites across North America as black mats. Carbonaceous silts or dark organic clays. The age of the base of this black layer coincides with the abrupt onset of younger driest cooling. Yeah. Which there is no evidence for either in situ extinct megafaunal remains or Clovis artifacts. Increasing evidence suggests that the extinction of many mammalian and avian taxa occurred abruptly, perhaps catastrophically, at the onset of the YD. And this extinction was pronounced in North America where at least 35 mammal genera disappeared, including three mammoths, mastodons, ground sloths, horses, camels, along with birds and smaller mammals. Yeah, I forgot about the North American horses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah that there horses, were horses here before. And they were distinctly and they would different. Extinct. They were distinctly different, too, because they had adapted to our megafaunal and to any other source. I wonder what that was like. Or, uh, I need to read dude. on some of the Native American histories. Because I wonder if they, any um, of them had like cultural memories of yeah. the horses, I, I, so that when they saw them come back in. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't know if he gets into it specifically, but um, oh, because I think the Spanish and the Europeans brought horses back here. Yeah, it's a uh, Dan something. He's a author, and he he wrote the book. He was on Joe Rogan's podcast. He was a Dan something. He wrote the book. Um, the hard hardcore history guy? No. No, not Dan Carlin. Um, I'll have to look it up real quick. But yeah, talk about the mega funnel real quick. Oh, yeah, wow. so look this up real quick. at Murray Springs, Arizona, a well-known Clovis site, mammoth bones and Clovis age stone tools lie directly beneath the black layer where, as described by Haynes, the sudden extinction of the Pleistocene megafauna would be dramatically revealed by explaining that all were gone in an instant before the black mat was deposited. It was uh, Dan Flores. Dan Flores. So he's a, he's a writer and, histori- and historian specializing in cultural and environmental study of the American West. With the uh, most recent book being Wild New World, the oh, epic so story of animals and people in America. He talks about the animals? He talks about, he's done the a lot Ice of work Age on ones? it. He, I don't know if his book specifically goes into it, but mm-hmm. yeah, he um, he definitely has talked about like the North American mammals mm-hmm. and like, you know, he has done some of the work and talks about it. I'm not sure how credentialed he is in exactly like this era of yeah, megafaunal, yeah, yeah. but he definitely talks about it on Joe Rogan's podcast. Gets into it a bit because he has uh, he has a differing opinion on the. Um, maybe there's another guy too. I'm mixing in with it, but he definitely talks about it. Um, he doesn't believe in like the ancient civilizations. Well, well he believes in like the overkill like theory. Oh, and, he like, believes overkill. Yeah. Yeah. So it's still controversial right now. And that's actually what we're going to go on in the paper. That's the next paragraph. But um, <laughs> right. yeah, like scientists, some of them are of the opinion that it was humans that killed off these animals they do attribute climate change but they attribute climate change in a gradual sense right 
They don't but attribute it's it to called the overkill hypothesis because it's right. humans that are killing doing the majority, yeah. right? But it doesn't really fit all the evidence if you look at it worldwide, right. because there's worldwide ex- extinctions of same megafauna time. at the same time and at different levels, at different levels with the epicenter, like the highest which would make, concentration which would make being North America. Yeah, which would make sense when if if what this paper is suggesting is true that there was a ET event that collided with Earth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. The cause of this extinction has long been debated and remains highly controversial in part to the limitations of available data, but also because the two major competing hypotheses, human overkill and abrupt cooling, fall short of explaining many observations. For example, Grayson and Meltzer summarize serious problems with the overkill hypothesis, such as the absence of kill sites for 33 genera of extinct animals, including camels, sloths. In addition, well, let's talk about that real quick. So yeah, real quick. We don't have kill sites of humans hunting camels and sloths, which makes sense. Like, there's better prey out there and probably better meat. Like, Yeah, if you think about, like, meat to effort, like a scale of meat to effort, you're probably yeah. going to go with the mastodons because they're slower. They're probably easier to... And maybe we prefer the meat, people. too. You and know? the meat's you probably to, better. Right. Yeah. It would probably be a really fatty. Yeah, you probably live off it for a long time. Yeah. And I'm sure they had, especially in the Ice Age, you can think of a way to mm. refrigerate meat. Right. <laughs> huh. That's funny. <coughs> I never thought about that. And they had fire. We know they had fire. Mm-hmm. So you've refrigerated it in the ice and then you pull it out and they yeah, probably which I mean makes you think sense, though like I'm, we don't I'm literally I'm everything picturing, you know no that's true and and what other people talk about are like how hunter gatherers that we know that exist on the planet now like they don't overkill their prey and even in past like they mm-hmm, don't overkill mm-hmm. their prey unless they're well and we didn't have the population some of the populations of some of these animals like way outnumbered humans exactly. and especially when taken all together to a degree that it does, it just, it doesn't make sense that humans could kill them all. Like humans are still kind of small fry at this point. I mean, it dep- I guess it depends on the time frame that we're talking about, though, because if we're talking about, you know, it depends on the gestational period of the of the prey. Because if you're killing them at a certain time frame where they're about to have a baby, but they don't, mm-hmm. you know, like there's mm-hmm. a lot of factors actually in hunting and like what it takes to overkill something, because. If you're talking about something that takes two years to gestate, obviously right. I don't know, but I there can, are things I can that agree take long. with overkill. Like we know elephants take a long time. Yeah, like imagine this as like a variation where overkill can turn into its own argument against it, because overkill makes more sense after a cataclysm where most of everything just got wrecked, and anyone who survived is really going to have to, like, worry about food. Yeah. So at that point, whatever survivors, it can seem a little more reasonable that overkill is a hypothesis for, like, finishing them off. For sure, yeah. I mean, that makes sense if they're already teetering. But that still doesn't work for some of these animals where there's no kill sites for, like, camels and sloths. Well, and... there are there is evidence of like a large group of of um mastodons or or woolly mammoths that uh, like all died with like broken legs there was like a right. certain place where they found a bunch of fossils that's in alaska you get a lot yeah. of that and i don't know about the ones like in russia like in siberia yeah it's almost like they were all hit with something big mm-hmm. at one time they broke mm-hmm. their legs you know, like a shock wave wave would do based on the mass of the thing it's hitting. Mm -hmm. It's going to do more and more damage. Yeah. All right. So in addition, although abrupt cooling episodes of magnitude similar to the YD occurred often during the past 80,000 years, none are known to be associated with major extinctions. The possibility of pandemic diseases also has been suggested, but there's no evidence for that in the Pleistocene record. Plus, the end Pleistocene extinction event is unique 
within the late Quaternary and is unlikely to have resulted from only climate cooling and human overkill. Yeah. The extinctions were too broad and ecologically deep to support these hypotheses. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, if they don't... Sh pandemic disease, if I was thinking about it, it would be a long, slow thing. Like, unless it was like, I guess it could have been a super killer or super whatever. It might yeah, have been, but, it, but it could know. also be associated because we actually have record of like the cooling periods. There was like the medieval cooling and the medieval warming period, the little ice yeah. age. Yeah. And it is when pandemics happened. That's a good point. You know? Anyway, yeah. uh, extraterrestrial catastrophes also have been proposed. For example, La Violette suggests that a large explosion in our galactic core led to the extinctions. Breckenridge postulated that a supernova killed the megafauna and caused the worldwide deposition of the black layer. Klub and Napier proposed multiple accounts with remnants of the mega comet progenitor of the torrid meteor stream and comet Enki. Although ET events have long been proposed as triggers for mass extinctions, such as the KT at 65 million years ago and the PT at 250 million years ago. What are those referring to again? So the KT event at 65 million years ago, that's the comet that killed the dinosaurs. Right. And then the PT was 250 million years ago. Yeah. So that's even further back that we have no idea well, like, yeah, I'm sure. I think there's a fossil record for the animals before that too. But um, is it more dinosaurs? Um, I don't know when dinosaurs started. <laughs> actually, I don't think they got hit twice. I think the dinosaurs, dinosaurs took over after. Maybe the, the dinosaurs maybe. restarted their civilization multiple times. Maybe <laughs> that's why the reptilians are so mad because they keep getting hit by They're comets. Like, Fuck this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Right there, the uh, next paragraph. In the 1990s, W. Topping discovered magnetic microspherules and other possible ET evidence in sediment at the Ganey Paleo American site in Michigan. And Lofleet and By reported that late Pleistocene glacial drift contained similar cosmic spherules. We now report substantial additional data from multiple well dated stratigraphic sections across North America supporting a major ET airburst or collision near 12.9 thousand years ago, directly beneath the black mat. Where present, we found a thin sedimentary layer containing high concentrations of magnetic microspherules and grains, nanodiamonds, iridium at above background levels and fullerenes containing ET helium. These indicators are associated with charcoal, soot, carbon spherules, and glass-like carbon, all of which suggest intense wildfires. Most of these markers are associated with previously recorded impacts, but a few are atypical of impact events. We identify this layer as the YD boundary. We refer to this incident as the YD event. Um, yeah, that's given some more clarity to the way they you know, use the evidence and yeah. So word it it's just that. establishing <laughs> our Smarkers. terms for the YD event. Yeah. Like what we're talking about is this thing 12.9 thousand years ago where there's yeah. a black mat and where below that you find iridium, carbon and all this stuff. Yeah. I'll um, read this next piece. Yeah. <clears throat> At the site studied independent radiocarbon and optical optically stimulated luminescent dates that tend to cluster near 13,000 years ago, were used to establish the age of the YDB, the Younger Dryas boundary layer. For example, the end Clovis stratum is well dated at Murray Springs, Arizona. Eight dates averaging 10.89 calendar years, right? Or no, or calendar 12.9 thousand years ago. That's right. And the nearby Laner site dates averaging 10.94 calendar year or 12.93 um, thousand years ago. 
Haynes correlated the base of the mat with the onset of Younger Dryas cooling dated to 12.9 thousand years ago in the GISP ice core Greenland sample. And there's a figure there. So if you want to. So you therefore. Enter it. They yeah. So therefore the they. Age. we Yeah. They have adopted the calendar age of 12.9. Give or take a thousand. Uh, hundred years. Yeah. For the YD event. So yeah. 12.9 give or take a hundred years. For the younger Dryas. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of sites that show. And have confirmed this and this yeah. is all and publicly this yeah. is all scientific you can look at twelve point nine thousand years ago in yeah. any established site across the world and you see a as long, like matter. within proximity of north america and radially outward to a lesser degree yeah you Where can the, see these proxies yeah and keep in mind that this event didn't entirely destroy the ice sheet Mm -hmm. therefore finding a giant crater like everybody wants to find when they're looking at this stuff is really doesn't like two mile thick of ice and you're talking about something that probably went you know yeah i don't know i don't know if it penetrated or not it may maybe it did maybe it did and maybe pieces of it remain like portions if it did you would expect to see a crater though yeah, but what, what about you got uh, the Great I'm, Lakes, right? Yeah, and you got the Carolina I think Bays the Great that Lakes are not themselves might be interesting to look at, as, right? Because we least mentioned earlier contributed by this event, right? Or at least they're a remnant of it. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, even if they existed before, they would have like been expanded probably by it. You know, yeah, most likely because you got to think like they were. But also I think it's elliptical. already thought that like it was the ice age and the glaciers that carved them out. But it wouldn't hurt to have a little help along with that glacier being punched in by a comet. Right. And how many times, if at all, do they know that the ice remained where it was, right? It could have receded and gone back. Yeah. They they have a lot of evidence for different portions of that. I think you can tell it from like the sediment layers. Right. Um, But yeah, we can keep going here. We, pr- we propose that the YD event resulted from multiple ET airbursts along with surface impacts. We further suggest that catastrophic effects of this ET event and associated biomass burning led to the abrupt YD cooling. Contributed to the late Pleistocene megafon- megafaunal extinction, promoted human cultural changes, and led to immediate decline in some post-Clovis human populations. And... That is referring to the fact that there is a steep decline in the cult, human cultures at that layer. Yeah, the activity of them. <coughs> the activity of them, what you would have assumed to have seen at the time. You, um, Yeah, you lose all that evidence. There's nothing after it. And I think it goes on to... I did... Yeah, I think it goes on to talk about how... Um, it was how abrupt it was with a lot of this evidence. Right. Yeah, next they talk about the research sites. And then they've got this table on the markers and images and measurements from the black mat layer. Yeah, you really should really go, cool graphs. You really should go check out this Yeah, uh, we're going to link to the website. article. <laughs> PNAS, sorry. Um, PNAS website. Anyway, we are past due for a break here, so uh, man, we'll be back. It's really flying, isn't it? A little bit. Yeah, it really is. Enjoy. See you in a minute.
Skip ahead in the paper. Um, there's a bunch of like really ultra nerdy, but they go over each of the impact proxies in each yeah. section in more detail with pictures and, and tables. Tables and, and they show the carbon like glass, the yep. carbon spherules. Yep, all the different deposits. They talk about the soot, the charcoal, iridium, and nickel is really interesting to me because. There's only so much iridium, like, built into, like, the core of, like, Earth that came together as part of the planet because it's one of the elements, right? So right. there's so much of it as a certain abundance mm-hmm. in the crust. And at this layer, you see at that layer. an overabundance <clears throat> of that iridium, which is a clear indicator of an extraterrestrial object, not a home, a, like, home Earth generated mm-hmm. effect. Right, and even if it was, it would have to have been like a volcano or something that spewed it. Right, that would have, but that would have offset. Volcanoes the, can spew iridium right. at higher levels of concentration, but the higher levels aren't as high as what they find with extraterrestrial impacts. Right, and even if they were as high, they aren't found in the nature and the of how they found these things. Right, because this That was a prehistoric thing. Right, but right. Even still, you would have found, you would have seen the volcano before you saw the proxy. Yeah, it's just the, the signature of volcanoes and the signatures of comets, as far yeah, as it were iridium, exactly. they're different because right. they're a different level. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's, the it, go, it, it covers a lot of the, the evidence. It has different these examples. These magnetic microspherules are pretty cool. They I've seen a demonstration cool. of this where they're like, they actually like take a magnet yeah, against some of the dirt it. and they pull the stuff out yep. and then they like, yeah think of it i mean i'm sure a lot of you a lot of you have witnessed it where you put a magnet on dirt and things come up yeah so it's not then, then there's if this not part with go look it up youtube is ET full of cool helium. videos this is another of cool, weird stuff so <laughs> <laughs> yeah so fullerenes and et helium the, uh-huh. That's like another one of these proxies that is evidence that it's from an extraterrestrial impact. Uh-huh. Specifically. Because ET helium, it's it's a it's an isotope of helium that doesn't occur right. on Earth. It, it occurs is on it comets. Helium three? I don't know. I think it they, they named it earlier. They Up oh, top, probably they they did name maybe, it earlier. Maybe. I think it was helium. Anyway, it's it's one of the isotopes. Helium ratio that is eighty four times that of the air. Yeah, so they're they're um, hollow. Oh, the that's fullerenes, what it is. they're hollow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, after they go into each of these Did you talk about the sediment there about it? Mm-hmm. They go in more detail about the IR anomaly. <clears throat> Yeah, we can skip into the nature of the event. Yeah, the nature of the event. So this will actually just give you a little more visual of what the the thing happening was like. Okay. You want to start? Yeah, I'll start the first paragraph here. The evidence – oh, here we go. The evidence points to an ET event with continent-wide effects, especially biomass burning – But the size, density, and composition of the impactor are poorly understood. Even so, current data suggests that this impactor was very different from well-studied iron, stony, and chondritic impactors. For example, for example, yeah, for example, the KT boundary. Um, The evidence is more consistent with an impactor that was carbon-rich, nickel, iron poor, and therefore most likely a comet. Although the current geologic and geochemical evidence is insufficient to fully understand impact dynamics, we can offer speculation for future work. 
So Tune et al. suggests that an impact capable of continent-wide damage requires energy of 10 to the 7th megatons, equivalent to an impact by a larger than 4-kilometer-wide comet. Although an impactor that size typically leaves an obvious large crater, no such late Pleistocene crater has been identified. The lack of a crater may be due to prior fragmentation of a larger impactor. Yeah. Thereby producing multiple air bursts or craters. Hypervelocity oblique impacts experiments indicate that low impedance surface layers such as an ice sheet can markedly reduce modification of the underlying substrate if the layer is equal to the projectile's diameter. Yeah, that's These what results I was, sorry, suggest, that's, yeah. that's what I was suggesting earlier. Yeah. Yeah, what the the and that says specifically the Laurentide ice sheet. Mhm. So was two miles basically thick. if it's 2 miles thick, yeah. and after the 4 kilometer thing broke up, right. We're talking in different units here, so that's a little awkward. Yeah. But <laughs> look it up. We have the internet now. Yeah. I'm not doing your conversions. Um so as long as the piece that hits is not two miles big right then it won't necessarily leave an impression on the thing below the ice and especially because they say it if a two kilometer the the results suggest that if a multiple two kilometer objects struck the two kilometer thick laurentide ice sheet at 30 degree less less than than 30 30 degrees. degrees they may have left negligible traces after deglaciation. Thus, lasting evidence may have been limited to enigmatic depressions or disturbances in the Canadian Shield, e.g. under the Great Lakes or Hudson Bay, while producing marginal or no shock effects and dispersing fine debris composed of the impactor ice sheets, detritus, and underlying crust. Yeah. Yeah, they named the Great Lakes and Hudson Bay there. I mean, those are elliptical, too. Yeah. Look at every single one of those gray lakes. Right? Wow. Yeah. Well, no. They're all pretty elliptical. Some of them are kind of like... Cur- yeah, yeah. But they're sure. elliptical. I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, may, I might be just uh, seeing I mean, things. That might just be the nature of lakes. I mean, so, some just look like flooded rivers, like reservoirs. Yeah, I guess that's true. But those aren't natural. <laughs> so they go on to say... Tune et al. Is that how you say it? Yeah, so the Tune scientist et named Tune yeah. et al. So that's all the people he's working with. Tune et al. Also noted that if air, fir- air bursts explode with energy of 10 to the 7th megatons at optimal height, they will cause blast damage over an area the size of North America that is equivalent to a ground impact of 10 to the 9th megatons. Such air air bursts effectively couple the impactor's kinetic energy with the atmosphere or surface, producing devastating blast waves well above hurricane force. Um, I don't know how to express that, but <clears throat> uh, hurricane force, which is seventy meters per second to the negative one. I don't know. What that yeah, is. yeah. Anyway, in nineteen oh eight at Tunguska. Tunguska Siberia, a object less than 150 meters in diameter, either a carbonaceous asteroid or a small burned-out comet, produced a less than 15 megaton airburst with an intense fireball, um, which was 10 to the 7th degree centigrade, that scorched 2 kilometer... 200. 200 kilometer squared of trees and leveled 2,000 kilometers squared of <clears throat> forests yet produced no crater or shock metamorphism. A debris shower from a heavily fragmented comet would have produced an airburst barrage that was similar to, although exponentially larger, than Tunguska, while causing continent-wide biomass burning and ice sheet disruption, but again, possibly without typical cratering right so <clears throat> dang so you can That's... have an incredible blast yeah, that it... lights hell shit on fire flattens hell shit and doesn't leave a crater 
Yeah. That's what it's saying. Well, well typical it, crater. Because it's an airburst. Right. That's what they're calling it. So there's an airburst, which means it doesn't hit the ground. And each each of those airburst blasts still, is like a, more than a hurricane force. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it's, what was it, 10 to the ninth megatons? Mm-hmm. That's a ground impact. Yeah. <clears throat> what was the... Um, yeah, 10 to the ninth megatons. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, anyway. so there is the – there's some pictures. I don't know if they're actual photos or are there artist renderings of the flattened trees. Are those real pictures? Those are real pictures. Yeah. Like so, Tunguska. Yeah, so those People are – People went and took pictures. It was yeah, 1908, so, so cameras were new. Shoddy, yeah, at best. But, um, yeah, there's a picture of trees flattened it. in all directions – over what looks like the center of an airburst that didn't hit the ground but caused a shock wave and flattened everything within this what was the square miles look at this yeah i'll save some of these pictures there is, it, it i don't know if that's just a natural hill but it does kind of look like the it, okay it looks like that a natural hill cuz it's kind of rolling there see yeah <clears throat> Dude. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, every, except for the odd strongest tree in the world that does stand up still. <laughs> yeah, there's one standing up. <laughs> it's got another tree wrapped around it. You see that? Yeah, it's like curled around it because of the super, how hot it probably was. Dang. I want to Dude, it looks like you took a bunch of trees and just bent it. Like you heat it up, like you would do with like a copper pipe. Uh -huh, you heat uh -huh. it up and you can bend it. Yeah, that's crazy, dude. Tunguska. Yeah, nuts. go. We'll 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 post some of these. In Any the, animals in the over notes, there are just vaporized, you know, like be gone. Pink mist, as they say. Yeah, <laughs> pink mist. Yeah, it's gross. That's gross. Yeah, sorry for that visual. Uh, environmental <laughs> effects. The YD event would have created a devastating high temperature shock wave with extreme overpressure, followed by underpressure, resulting in intense winds traveling across North America at hundreds of kilometers per hour, accompanied by powerful impact generated vortices. In addition, whether single or multiple objects collided with Earth, a hot fireball would have immersed the region near the impacts and would have been accentuated if the impact angles were oblique. For comparisons, Fetlov calculated that Tunguska-sized airbursts would immerse the ground with a radiation flux severe enough to ignite 200 square yeah. kilometers of forest within seconds. Within seconds, dude. Dude. Yeah, that's like taking a... That's Just like, look at the place you live, yeah. draw a line around it, pull it up on Google Maps... Draw a line around it of 200 kilometers. What's that in miles? This is not going to be a regular thing. We're not going to convert it, but we want to know. That's 125 miles. Yeah. So we're in Sacramento. That would easily encompass the San Francisco Bay Area and most of the way out to Nevada. <sighs> yep. Gone. Yeah. Gone. And pretty high north, pretty high south. Like oh, the yeah. Bay Area is gone. That's just incinerated, though. Like no, that's yeah. not talking about the after effects. Right. That's just the incinerated in yeah. seconds. Yeah. Holy. That's intense. Wow. Thus, multiple larger airbursts would have ignited many thousands of square kilometers at greater distances. Oh, Hold on. At greater distances. What I was just uh, the I was just thinking of like what that would have looked like on a ice sheet, right? Right. If you do that same thing, right? You put you if put you have where the we live to in the center of a glacier, two hundred square miles of, of trees. If you do that over an ice sheet, yeah. how much of that ice sheet would be instantly vaporized. liquefied, and then the pressure wave causing cracking and and like bursting out? Yeah. Of, you know what? J just since we kind of visualize and talk through that a bit, mm -hmm. what if 
what happened, it happened and there was water sent up into the, which would have caused, a, I guess what I was trying to say is what if it caused like a giant lake, right? Like what if it hit central enough to where it caused like a vaporization and like a big thing, but like the glacier still remained. I don't know. I guess it, if it yeah. was like that big. I mean, part of it would. Well, because a lot of the evidence does point to like a slow process. Slowish. Well, the thing like, is when, you, when you measure in geological terms, you only have accuracy right. plus or minus like sometimes thousands years. or yeah. millions of years. Right. right and right, so right. when you do see a change, you if if the change is basically instant, but your your margin of error isn't as big as that instant, then you don't have like the resolution to tell how yeah. fast it happened. Right. You can just tell that it happened in that time period. Right. Yeah. So that means that it is possible that something like this could have happened and it caused like a giant lake in the middle of this glaciated field. And eventually the pressure pushed it. Yeah. But you have to take into account the rest, the of, rest the of the evidence. The rest of the energy from the explosion right, right. through the air, the hurricane force winds, sure, sure, the sure. heat. Okay, it was just a thought. I was just a thought. Yeah. I mean, a smaller one, maybe. Sure, sure, yeah. And, it and probably maybe there did was happen some then. of those. Yeah, yeah, it probably did happen. Because okay. it sounds like a, this was a comet that broke into pieces, and so you would have some air burst and maybe some ground impacts. Right. And since we know they actually didn't it fully – immediately disappear that still to go anyway right because yeah, we still have like in greenland the ice core samples right so whatever it did and there didn't were fully obliterate before, greenland though. yep but it probably obliterated the part around north america and caused like a mega flood yeah okay we'll continue now i think we're where were we <laughs> I think we're almost done with that paragraph. If if we're not done with it, we're at the very end. Because you said ignited in thousands seconds, of yeah. square miles in seconds. Yeah. At greater yep. distances, the re-entry of high-speed superheated ejecta, the re-entry, yeah. would have induced extreme wildfires, which would have decimated forests and grasslands. Right. So it wasn't necessarily the thing itself right when right. it happened. It was once it shot up into the atmosphere yeah. and it rained so you down imagine on like, Earth. Well, you imagine like a drop of water hitting yep. in in water. Still the water, water like blips yeah. out in the splash pattern. Yep. You will get Rain essentially back. a splash pattern of the yep. Earth when it gets hit. Yep. But because you're hitting the ice sheet. With such force. Yeah, yeah, it's the ice. But there's multiple impactors also igniting yep. the air those around are, those forests and stuff. Yep. Yeah, so it's like a anything under the umbrella of the initial blast is going to be hit with rain fire, hellfire. Yeah. Decimating forests and grasslands, destroying the food supplies of herbivores and producing charcoal, soot, toxic fumes, and ash. The number of ET airbursts or impacts necessary to induce the continent-wide environmental collapse at 12.9 thousand years ago is unknown. But we're talking continent-wide. You see this black mat layer where some of the black mats are charcoal. Some of the so, black mats are um, the impactor stuff and algae. And all that. Yeah. So, it, yeah, some of the reason it's black in some areas is charcoal, but in other areas it's actually algae. Right. And a lot of the areas it's not necessarily even black at all. It's yeah. just a layer of of disturbed ground mm -hmm. that deposited on what was at the time the bedrock, the matrix of the ground itself, which was then crushed yeah. down and to make this layer that we see today. And then it goes into climate changes that would be associated with it. A number of impact-related effects most likely contributed to the abrupt major cooling at the onset of the YD and its maintenance for over a thousand years. Cooling mechanisms operating on shorter timescales may have included ozone depletion, mm -hmm. causing shifts in atmospheric systems, in response to cooling with the side effects of allowing increased deadly UV radiation to reach the s survivors on the surface. 
atmospheric yeah, injection of nitrogen compounds, sulfates, dust, soot, and other toxic chemicals from the impact and widespread wildfires, all of which may have led to cooling by blockage of sunlight with the side effects of diminished photosynthesis for plants, Jeez. increased chemical toxicity for animals and plants, and injection of large amounts of water vapor and ice into the upper atmosphere to form persistent cloudiness and noctilucent noctilucent clouds that's a cool word <laughs> that is a cool word but i want to just stop there for a second and like imagine what it was like cuz humans lived through this yeah humans in north america cuz we've got the clovis right. sites we and, know right. that we still have people in north america afterwards people, but it took time to recover yeah no but imagine being one of those people that survived this yeah and being under Noctilucent uh, clouds yeah. and and um, Which, super assuming heated means ejecta. like blocking all sunlight. Yeah, yeah. So you got persistent cloudiness, upper atmosphere in the upper atmosphere, water vapor in large amounts. You got toxic chemicals, photos, um, diminished photosynthesis. Right. I mean, so even you're talking you, about like, even if you survive the you, initial you, impact and the heat burst, like then the sun's not going to come out. Barely any plants are going to grow. Yeah. A bunch of animals are going to die because there's yeah. not enough plants to eat. Yeah. A bunch of – it will cause more ability for us to overhunt and further extinct other animals. Yeah. Also, it would um, obviously fuck up any of us that lived in those areas. Yeah, I mean we're – everybody after, after that point is vitamin D deficient. Right. You barely can scrounge any plants. The yeah. hunting is going to be sparse. And the air is toxic, so you probably toxic. have to find a way to live underground if you mm -hmm. can live on the surface at all. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, and, and what you're doing if is you're, you're forced maybe to Maybe if you're on, like, the other side yeah, of the planet. Yeah, you're right. You're forced to move to a place where it's habitable. Yeah. Because what's interesting is if you look at, like, all the um, – analysis of this time in other continents like australia was the least impacted they still lost a bunch of their megafauna, um, megafauna yeah. but like 25 percent compared to like the 80 percent for north america right them that's way less and yeah and so they still like have, the climate event still would have, have killed animals and plants all over the world but the immediate like <clears throat> burst damage would have killed even more, like way incredibly more in the immediate area, like North America. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it makes, just makes sense. And especially the, the humans that were left alive trying to survive and hunting anything they could find to feed themselves. And obviously there were species that survived, but... Oh, interesting. What does it say? This is on the climate. Where did you stop? I'll pick up from there. <clears throat> Although these cooling mechanisms tend to be short-lived, do we do that? They can trigger long-term consequences through feedback mechanisms. For example, the noctilucent clouds can reduce solar insulation at high latitudes, increasing snow accumulation and causing further cooling in a feedback loop. The largest potential effect would have been impact related partially um, partial destabilization destabilization and or melting of the ice sheet in the short term this would have suddenly released meltwater and rafts of icebergs yeah. into the north atlantic and arctic oceans lowering surface ocean salinity with consequent surface cooling yeah the lar longer term cooling effects largely would have resulted from the consequent weakening of the thermohaline circulation in the north atlantic Sustaining YD cooling for over a thousand years until the feedback mechanisms restored ocean circulation. Yeah, so there had to have been a check some at some point. Like it just was, it would have kept going, but there was a there was a natural feedback yeah. mechanism that finally restored the circulation. So if you've seen like a bunch of like global warming type stuff, they'll talk or about. If you watch the day after tomorrow, or just like any documentaries, they'll talk about the ocean and climate and stuff. They'll talk about like the conveyor. Like the ocean current that yeah. goes across the whole world. Yeah. So if you drop a bunch of fresh water, glaciers melting all of a sudden into the oceans, that change of salinity will screw up those currents all across the world saying. and it can shut down that that ocean. The regularity current. of the – because we all know that oceans are – have a – play a major role in climate. 
Right. And if they you circulate the, the temperature from the, the equator up to the yeah up to the Arctic and back. Yep. And it's a it's a big loop that it does. It distributes the temperature. Otherwise, you would have even more cooling up north and even more heating in yeah. the yeah, you just equatorial think region because that heat isn't transferring as easily. Yeah. I mean, if you think about like like a hot tub and you dump a bunch of ice water in it, it's going to disrupt the current. It's going to, you know, it's going to, it'll just do some things. But right. Yeah, you're talking about a bunch of ice water being dumped in, fresh, fresh ice water being dumped into the oceans. Right. Because like the middle of it's being heated by the sun, but it spreads north and co- and it warms those oceans while the cold water comes back and cools these oceans. So it keeps it all more temperate. You shut down the current. Well, you, you oceans open. become hotter and yeah. then colder at up <clears> north, <throat> and the colder oceans up north create and create more ice formations. The change in dip, like the difference of pressure is going to cause crazier wind storms and storm like formations. Like hurricanes would form super easily because you're going to have like the high pressure and low pressure coming into contact even more. Yeah, with the moisture mm-hmm. and all that. Yeah. So you would have crazy like hurricane Vegas, storms, Vegas storms and stuff. Dude. So it goes on to talk about the Clovis people and the megafaunal. Um, it says... And then the conclusion. Let's just finish <clears throat> it out then. We're almost done. Okay. I'll... I'll well, at least... It. Yeah, we're almost done. All right. I'll... Um, so... Under the Clovis and megafauna, <clears throat> the impact-related effects would have been devastating for animals and plants. For humans, major adaptive shifts are evident at 12.9 thousand years ago, along with an inferred population decline as subsistence strategies changed because of dramatic ecological change and the extinction, extinction reduction and displacement of key prey species. Many sites indicate that both Clovis people and extinct megafauna were present immediately before the YD event, but except in rare cases, either appears in geologic records afterwards. Neither appears in the geologic record afterwards. Right. That's so, huge. Yeah, so the black mat covers the Clovis, covers the right. megafauna. You look at the nothing, black mat, and you go right below it, and you'll see, you see all that. mammoth. Bones next to with the sites. black mat laying on top of the mammoth bones, yep. staining the bones. Yep, it's on it. That means that the 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 period in which the black mat started killed that thing. Those right. things. It, right. it, it maybe it didn't necessarily kill that specific one, but no, because but I think, it means no, that that I, that thing was alive recent enough to I have to been covered by that thing or whatever. But I remember when I was at the conference um, about this and some of the scientists were being interviewed and they were talking about how like you can actually um, some of the stuff like penetrates right the bones no I I mean I'm not saying that I'm just saying that that specific one in you know mm-hmm. that was found being laid on top I'm just saying that not every single one was killed by it but right, was killed right. in a time where it's bones some were of still them, fresh yeah, right 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 I'm I'm just I'm not saying which anyway. is crazy like yep it's it's a pretty clear suggestion like that this is what killed them yeah absolutely it goes on to talk about um at Murray Springs butchered still articulated mammoth bones Clovis tools and hearth were found Buried directly beneath the black mat, like we were just talking about, indicating that it buried it, it <clears throat> indicating that it buried them rapidly. The YDB or the younger driest boundary markers, including iridium at 51 parts per billion, occurred inside an extinct horse skull at Wally's Beach Clovis Kill site. I mean, that means it was inside the inside skull, inside the skull, yeah, which means the skull was open to it, yeah. Again, suggesting suggesting rapid burial. Following the YD event, it is likely that some now extinct animals survived in protected niches, niches, only later to become extinct because of insufficient food sources. 
like I was saying, like mm-hmm. not all of them died over from it, but it, they died in the period disease, that they designed. And all other effects. Yeah, overhunting, right. climate change, disease, flooding, and other effects all triggered or amplified by the Younger Dryas event. Boom. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, even if it wasn't directly triggered, it was amplified. Right. So there was a lot of these things that could have already been in the the decline. Right. Like the climate was changing, right? We're, yeah, this was exactly. the period where we're coming out of the ice age. So like yeah. some of the climate, like the land has already been shifting. <clears throat> animals and plants probably were migrating and changing locations. So if something like that was already like happening it will get ample it could have been amplified by this absolutely absolutely you want to finish this off here our primary aim is to present evidence supporting the yd impact event a major et collision over north america at 12.9 thousand years ago which contributed to the younger driest cooling the mass extinction of the north american fauna and major adaptations and population declines among the paleo americans the unique carbon rich YDB layer coupled with a distinct assemblage of impact tracers implies isochroneity of the YDB datum layer and thus highlights its utility for correlation and dating of the North American late Pleistocene. These associations, if confirmed, offer the most complete and recent geologic record for an ET impact and its effects, such as global climate change and faunal extinction. This evidence also would represent a record of major ET event having serious widespread consequences for anatomically modern humans. Yeah. So it's a big thing. It killed off a bunch of animals. It killed off a bunch of humans. It caused us to have to hunt other things. It changed the climate. It caused a re- a dramatic re onset of the ice age while we were on a trend out of it. Like, yeah, it set forest fires everywhere. Like, yeah. it's a big thing. Yeah. Well, and it this sends is the- all that melt water from the, from the glaciers down North America, just dramatically changing the landscape, which we'll, we'll talk about more yeah. because Randall Carlson is a fascinating human and he has a lot of great research and does a lot of stuff in uh, Northwest of us that we hope to go on. So yeah. tours, but yeah. he's got a bunch of tours, Montana. He's got some ones out East. He's got some ones like in the, I think he does the Carolina bays. Yeah. Yeah. And he does stuff in, like, uh, Georgia and, like, stuff right. in, like, the, the hills. Idea, and- the article didn't explain this, but the other thing about the Carolina Bays is, like, imagine that impact on the ice sheet and then all these ice chunks flying up as the splash dropping down on the eastern seaboard. So they're pointing up there, like, oh, yeah, we did kind of talk about that. We talked about it a little bit, yeah. Dude, like, you're not going to survive. No. Like, the what? chances are, like, most people are dead. Exactly. Like, and the idea, and again, to touch on it a little bit, like the idea of this alternative history is to say that there it is possible with an event like this, that there was some, some type of civilization that could have lived and been around on North America, in North America and all, you know, and a lot of just the Northern this would hemisphere. would have had worldwide yeah. impact. So yeah. Like- so it could have been a lot of, and mostly in the Northern hemisphere, mm-hmm. a lot of the impacts were, um, but yeah, we, and you talk about a lot of these ancient myths and these like fables of like, you know, Atlantis and Lemuria and mm-hmm. Mu and a lot of these places that. It lines up with about. the flood myths, like we were talking about earlier, like those. Yeah. If something like this happened within human lifetime, which is humans were alive twelve thousand nine hundred years and this ago, is the beginning. We around. This is the beginning of what we are told is our our human civilization. If this isn't a great flood, I don't know what is. Absolutely, you know? it fits because it's so long before the beginnings of what is what would go on to become the mm-hmm. major religions around the world. Right, so that it would be. A, like amply called a myth because it was mm-hmm. so long ago. It would have to mm-hmm. be gen- like millennia have gone by. Right. If this happened to us today, civilization would be done. 
The Done. oceans would go up 400 feet. All the coastal cities are underwater. Done. Very few people Power's would gone. survive. Everything that we have. All of our food all systems. All of our modern All of modern our like, division of labor will collapse. Everything would, would go back to... Uh, uh, there would be survivors, though. Absolutely. And we would remember. <laughs> we would make sure to teach our kids yeah. what happened. Well, and not only that, and we, we would probably blame it on what we did as humans. Yeah, and we talk about we talk about the people who who knew a lot of stuff, and like, and I guess what I'm trying to say is we the if you survived a cataclysm like that in today's age, and you survived it for long enough <clears throat> to realize that you can't survive this long term, where are you going to settle? Where are you going to move to? You're going to move. To the people that right now in this day and age cohabit this world with us, our hunter gatherers mm -hmm. and remote civilizations, you would move there. You would you would try to 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 make friends with them, and you would you know you would maybe share some some tips on farming that you might have learned throughout your life, or you might share some knowledge or some crazy stories that these people have never heard. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about you know thousands of years have probably gone on, and a lot of the things that they are you're finally able to like make them understand if you don't even speak the lang same language hundreds of years maybe or whatever generations <clears throat> like these things like it it's not that far fetched if our society right. it's not that far fetched even if you look back to imagine a world where hunter gatherers like the Clovis people lived alongside people who had modern mm -hmm. amenities and modern comforts and whether that modern is the same as our modern or if it was a modern at whatever stage in evolution right. they were at. And what's important, like in the big picture to piece this back in with our conventional understanding of human civilization, all those types of, Evidences we pointed out earlier that there was advanced civilization. What would we expect to see of it now is what we're seeing now. Absolutely. Stonework. Right. That's the only thing that survives something like this. Anything and good, passed down anything over metal. 10,000, over 10,000. Our, 10, our, in our years. current age, all of our information on hard drives gone, gone, dude. useless. None of it will survive unless they specifically invent the exact same port adapter that goes the on Hoover your hard Dam drive. And it ain't gonna happen. Yeah, the Hoover Dam would survive. Sure, if it wasn't directly hit. Uh, yeah, Mount Rushmore obviously. would survive if it wasn't directly hit. Well, and the cool thing is, is that Hoover Dam at the very bottom, they have a plate that shows the the um, constellations in the sky at the time yeah. that, that it was built. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. Maybe Which thinking about the future when if – Likely if, if and what when. a lot of these ancients did with their structures because exactly. a lot of them – When you break down the archaeoastronomy of the site, they point to a date of the sky and oh. a lot of them point back to this time period. This, they point back to this 12.9 thousand years ago. Or later, yeah. In some cases, because the eleven thousand six hundred year ago event, where we also dramatically come out of the Younger yeah. Dryas, the warming event was another dramatic event. That that's not what this whole article was about. No, but it's part of the same thing, and we'll probably we'll definitely have to get into it. We don't have as much of a smoking gun with that one as we do with this one in the onset of it. Though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's theories that it could have been another um, asteroid or comet. That's one theory, and because or like solar flares, because it wasn't because it <clears throat> because it wouldn't have hit if it if, <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> if it uh, didn't hit ice or water if it mm -hmm. hit land it would right. have been a completely different story yeah as to how the Earth reacted to it yeah and we actually didn't bring up that the comet in uh, the comet stream so oh yeah. The this comet that they're talking about, they did talk about coming from the Torrids early in the paper. Yeah, the Torrid. We didn't point stream. that out. So, like, essentially, there's this thing in the solar system called the Torrid me meteor stream. It is the remnants of a giant comet. Yeah, that its orbit intersects with the Earth in two points. So twice a year, twice a year, we go through its orbit. 
and it has long ago broken up and decayed into all of these fragmentary pieces. And we travel through that section of the sky twice a year. And every time we do, we hit uh, meteor showers. And that's what you know is the torrids from late October, early November. Yep. And also in June. Yep. So if you're a sky watcher, you know about the torrids in late October, early November. Yeah, it's the... the, the that's the remnants of this comet stream. Yep. Yeah, and, you know, we've there's some people that liken it. I think Randall Carlson likens it to crossing a highway, crossing a highway yeah. blindfolded and hoping that you hit motorcycles and bikes. Right, so if you're not of, only blindfolded, but if you also get, you go to sleep and you get woken up at a random point and you don't know if it's day or night. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then you cross it. Yeah. If you happen to cross... At 4 a.m., likely right. there's not going to be any cars on the road. Right. But if you happen to cross in the middle of rush hour, yeah, like it's a much more dangerous transition across that. Absolutely. And that's essentially what we cross every year twice. Yeah. And, you know, for the most part, it's, you know, pretty uneventful. But there's definitely those times, you know, there's, there's a time of the day where it's going to be a little busier than the rest of the time. Mm-hmm. You know, we cross it twice a year, so. And this whole, there are some people that suggest that there is a cyclical nature to what portion of it you, like what portion of the torrid you might come across. Mm -hmm. So. Right. Like the 12th, I don't know if we have it fully mapped out. I know like NASA has mapped a, mapped a bunch of space objects that are like, uh, near earth crossing and some of them that are earth crossing um right but i guess i just mean like like 12.9 thousand years ago like there could be they would have been in a different section of its debris field and maybe it was a worse section then and right. maybe we're at some point in the future maybe it's soon maybe it's not but at some point in the future we will re-encounter that section of the yeah of the meteor stream and where there's bigger chunks and we're more likely to get hit. Right. So we have to be conscious of this. It's, you know, we're spending all this time and money on research. wars and BS when <laughs> we could be spending some energy figuring lot, out the heavens, figuring out where the dangers are and what we should be preparing for. Cause at some point, yeah, we will encounter something like this again. <clears throat> My voice gave out right at the end there. <laughs> Well, it's a good time because we're we're yeah. over, but <laughs> it's been super fun. This is a yeah. This dude, is I love this. This was topic. a great episode, and I'm excited to keep going into this more. And I'm sorry if it's frustrating for how many topics we're just like, and we'll get into that later. We'll try not to overly point those out, but yeah. I can't wait to That's just. True. We've got so many podcasts ahead of us to really dive into all of these topics. Yeah, in we're more just detail. excited. We're excited for especially these first few and. Getting them out. But we have to take into account that uh, this is probably something really dramatic that happened for this planet. Yep. And, and it probably caused a lot of devastation. What it would have been like for the humans who lived there. Lent, then Survived it. How advanced we were back then. What evidence we would have left of it. It's all mysteries that it's going to take time. We to unravel, but in We're order excited. for us to really unravel it, we need to be open minded and we need to not yeah. shut ourselves down to the possibility yeah. that this world is Full more of, complicated yeah. and mysterious. Yeah, and that the, uh, the picture painted by you know the authority of knowledge is not necessarily uh, the whole truth. Yeah, so. Keep your minds open, stay curious, keep uh, investigating the nature of reality, and we'll check in with you next time. Adios. Later.